Good morning, everyone. It's um, uh, good to see you all. Uh, hopefully, uh, you're remaining uh, safe and healthy. Um, we've got a great uh, program today. We're going to talk about um, you know, hydrogen, which is something that has uh, emerged over the last year and a half or so as a, a, a you know, a, a kind of almost consensus, if you will, um, driver towards uh, deep decarbonization or pathways towards that. So. So um, we'll hear from uh, a couple of really uh, just phenomenal speakers. Uh, um, in particular, I'm, I'm got the pleasure of being joined by Carlos Espina. He's a business development manager for uh, Linda Gas for hydrogen and syngas. Um, I also uh, have with us today uh, Dolph Gielen, uh director at Arena, that's the International Renewable Energy Agency Innovation and Technology Center. Um, and then Ricky Sakai, he's a uh, vice president of new business development uh, at Mitsubishi Heavy Industries Americas. Um, they all bring a different um, uh, a different perspective to the hydrogen discussion, which I think will be uh, very enriching for all of you. Um, of course, you know hydrogen. Uh, just a couple of remarks on that. Hydrogen is an interesting fuel. It's it's not the first time, obviously. Um, there have been pretty robust discussions about hydrogen as, a, as an energy source. Um, I think if you go back 20 years or so, um, there was a pretty big competition emerging between hydrogen and electrification uh, or hybridization even in, in transportation. Um, and uh, that sort of settled out, but um, kind of remained percolating under the surface, I guess, until recently. Um, and as concerns about climate change have grown um, and efforts around the world by governments and corporations to really seek lower carbon pathways um, in the energy mix have really increased. Um, you've seen hydrogen really emerge as in many ways, a leader in the discussion, particularly as you think about decarbonizing some of the hard to decarbonize sectors like the industrial sector and the transportation sector. Um, and even in power generation, when we think about um, providing stability to grids for intermittent renewables, hydrogen as an energy storage uh, pathway is, is something that is also receiving a lot of discussion discussion and attention. So um, it's an interesting energy source, to say the least. And what makes it even more remarkable, which you hear, hear a little bit about today, is all of the different ways you can produce it. So it, it, it provides diversity, not only in balancing um, energy portfolios in a low carbon way, but it also provides diversity in terms of how it can be produced, which means in different places around the world where some pathways are cheaper than others, you might actually see those leveraged um, with the same end product, namely hydrogen. So um, it's definitely an interesting space to watch and a, and a rapidly evolving one. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna pass it over to, to Carlos Espina. Um, he's gonna give us a sort of a brief overview of um, you know, the current lay of the land because hydrogen is already an active market. Um, it's uh, largely dominated by what we call gray hydrogen, but um, you know, there's a lot of, you know, as we know, interest in, in transforming um, uh, uh, hydrogen markets and expanding them at the same time. So he's going to give us some insights into what he sees at Linda Gas every day um, and, uh, um, you know, how markets look currently as well as how they, 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 they sort of may be evolving. And then after that, I will pass it over to to Dolph, um, and he'll give us his perspective um, at Arena from some of the work that he's been doing on how costs are evolving for different ways to produce hydrogen and different applications um, uh, for hydrogen energy source. And then we'll hear from, from Ricky following that, um, specifically with regard to what MHI is doing and um, how they're actually viewing hydrogen as an increasingly important part of their portfolio. So. Um, once we finish up there, uh, we will open the floor to Q&A, um, and I look forward to fielding your questions and having a pretty robust conversation. So with that, Carlos, I'm going to pass it over to you. Okay. Thanks, Ken. Well, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Carlos Ospina. I'm a business development manager for uh, hydrogen and syn gas uh, at Linde. I'm uh, uh, based in the Woodlands, uh, Texas. And um, I have been having um, uh, experience in um, uh, in the carbon markets and um, and industrial gases uh, uh, mainly. 
So um, today I want to talk um, a little bit about um, our perspective, what are we seeing in terms of, let's say, these uh, drivers behind the uh, decarbonization uh, uh, of hydrogen production. Um, uh, just a very brief uh, uh, description uh, of Linde. Uh, I guess some of you might be familiar. We're an industrial gases company. Uh, and we have been in the atmospheric and hydrogen and sink gas business for uh, over 100 years. And um, uh, currently, uh, let's say in the Gulf Coast, we have a capacity for a production capacity of hydrogen of around 1.7, 1.8 uh, billion cubic feet per day. And we have uh, uh, an extensive uh, network of pipelines that we use to distribute. So we are on the market uh, uh, for hydrogen uh, uh, on a daily basis, of course. And uh, what we have uh, uh, been seeing is that, uh, of course, there are, let's say, two big broad uh, uh, market segments in terms of uh, uh, hydrogen uh, that you could call. Uh, one will be for mobility itself. And the other will be, uh, let's say, for hydrogen as a feedstock, where it's for uh, uh, refining or uh, petrochemical uh, production. We are starting to see emerging, let's say, another segment that uh, uh, is still very early, but the use of hydrogen in, uh, in natural gas uh, pipelines uh, for the production of power, but also for the, let's say, the decarbonization of the natural gas uh, grid uh, overall. That we uh, that is uh, uh, something that is early, but is starting to make um, uh, uh, to make some noise. So, uh, in terms of the hydrogen market, so of course there was a, a, there was a, a let's say it was affected by the by the overall uh, downturn uh, related to the uh, to the COVID situation. Uh, and what we have seen is that um, uh, let's say the existing uh, refining petrochemical operations continue. But um, some of the, let's say, new or expand new capacity or expansion projects are being uh, rethink, uh, are being rethought uh, about. Um, we have seen uh, more uh, that um, some of the traditional, uh, let's say, oil and gas players are now uh, looking uh, at, at more projects uh, in terms of um, uh, uh, renewable fuels, in particular uh, renewable diesel. It has been a very uh, a very big uh, driver lately. Uh, you can really see a, a shift uh, in the market. Let's say uh, back in uh, I arrived in the, I was transferred to the US in around 2016. By around that time, um, let's say uh, the decarbonization of hydrogen production was not uh, let's say was not well received uh, in the market. Uh, let's say that the, 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 the customers uh, were not really looking at uh, an, anything that could uh, add any value, and there was no real perception of how could you potentially uh, have a pathway to monetize, let's say, the, the low carbon or uh, characteristic or the environmental characteristics of that uh, of that product. So that has changed. I mean, I don't want to, I don't like to use this word, but that has changed dramatically. And, and nowadays, uh, uh, what you're seeing is that. Um, uh, the, the, the traditional oil and, gas, oil and gas players are coming into uh, into this side of the market. Originally, uh, in principle, what we were seeing were more, let's say, the the more uh, venture capitalist uh, types of uh, entrepreneurial uh, 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 companies that uh, were coming with developments of new technologies that will uh, make use or produce, let's say, lower carbon uh, lower carbon hydrogen. Uh, but now you clearly see uh, uh, some of the uh, major oil and gas players that are uh, uh, moving to um, retrofit some of their refining operations and to uh, uh, install new capacity uh, mostly for uh, for renewable diesel so in, in all of this uh, uh, of course the, the the california lcfs uh, has uh, played a, a major role it has been a driver really in terms of uh, uh, creating let's say the possibility to uh, monetize the, the, the environmental uh, attributes uh, of low carbon hydrogen uh, in a way that uh, makes uh, you know a lot of business sense uh, uh, for uh, for the companies. So uh, a, a lot of the uh, of the new developments are are, are being uh, 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 done on the back of the expectation that uh, similar systems to the California LCFS are uh, are going to be uh, developed. Uh, probably, uh, I'm not sure if at a state level or broader level, but uh, national, but also in in other countries uh, uh, like Canada. So you re you really see a, 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 a lot of um, rearrangement uh, in the market, 
um, let's say the, the, the traditional, let's say hydrogen producers like my company, we are not just the only ones now, let's say uh, in the game. Uh, we also be uh, seeing, let's say, our uh, our approach challenged by new by new market participants that are looking to come in with uh, different technologies for the production of renewable fuels that um, uh, have, uh, let's say, a requirement on hydrogen or produce hydrogen as a byproduct uh, in some times. Yes. So, <clears throat> from a from a let's say commercial point of view. Uh, blue hydrogen, let's say, is um, right now a viable possibility under certain specific conditions. So it is possible to to make and sell green hydrogen uh, today, and uh, you know, make an interesting business for the parties, while of course decarbonizing, decarbonizing that uh, th those volumes. Uh, uh, we still don't see uh, we still see green hydrogen as um, let's say at an earlier stage. This is still not as competitive. Uh, and there's also, uh, uh, of course, let's say a, a technology, uh, a, a, a technology barrier there. Let's say, especially when you look at the larger scales that are uh, that are required for the, let's say, the volumes that you will look at in the uh, industrial setups, right? So there, there's a still, uh, let's say, a, a disconnect there. Uh, we expect that uh, on, on the green hydrogen side, and we're talking about mostly uh, electrolysis uh, here. We expect that there is going to be, let's say, a, a, a cost reduction core somehow similar to what happened to solar and wind that is going to help, a, 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 let's say, promote that in a, let's say, medium to, to, to long term, uh, eight to 10 years or so, that um, we'll be able to have a, a much better competitiveness uh, of green hydrogen. But uh, right now, there are other alternatives um, uh, for the carbonization of hydrogen uh, that can be, uh, let's say, cheaper in that uh, it is possible to achieve uh, the same uh, very, I mean, not as deep levels as green hydrogen, but deeper levels of uh, blue hydrogen. You know? uh, so, um, <clears throat> this, uh, so we're trying to, to, to understand that, uh, these market conditions to see how can, uh, uh, how can it uh, play there. Uh, in terms of um, CCS, CCS is one uh, of those uh, alternatives. So when you when you look at a, let's say a, at a renewable diesel producer that is looking to have a, a low carbon hydrogen supply, so they can uh, improve the carbon intensity of the renewable diesel product, um, the, this the, this particular company will have a, a, a different array uh, of opportunities. You know? so for example, reusing the off gases coming from the renewable diesel product will take you very close to the carbon intensity reduction that you will get with a carbon uh, uh, capture and sequestration project. So in terms of the uh, of the viability of uh, CCS uh, being one of the uh, uh, key options uh, for decarbonization of hydrogen, uh, uh, I we think that, that is one of the uh, is one of the options. Um, right now, um, there are, let's say, um, um, least least capex intensive uh, alternatives that are possible to uh, to be implemented and still achieving uh, a, a very good level of decarbonization of the uh, uh, of the uh, of the hydrogen production. So, well, uh, this is um, um, this is um, uh, uh, this moment in time is is, is is very interesting because we're seeing all these uh, uh, different uh, let's say options uh, to decarbonize. Uh, some of them uh, will still need some time to develop. But we're also seeing that, that the market is really starting to uh, to pick up in terms of uh, of demand uh, uh, for low carbon uh, for low carbon hydrogen. So uh, it is it, it is very important now to to understand uh, from the technology point of view uh, uh, and from the user side uh, point of view uh, how the the, the, the landscape uh, uh, is going to continue looking like. Uh, there is a lot of expectations also in terms of the new administration, uh, in terms of how, uh, let's say, how the, the new policies could be uh, supportive uh, towards uh, uh, decarbonization of, um, of hydrogen. Uh, but um, we have been in this uh, place before. Uh, I, I just wanted to highlight that uh, uh, probably this is um, a deja vu moment. Uh, we had some similar, let's say, uh, momentum around, I would say, early 2000, 2002, 2004, 
uh, after let's say the, the Kyoto Protocol opened this possibility to monetize uh, some of the you know uh, uh, emission reduction uh, or environmental attributes. Uh, then we saw let's say a, a, a big hype uh, around 2010 and 12, and uh, some of uh, some CCS projects were developed, and there was a big support uh, from the government, but it it went down again. So here we are again, around 10 years after. And um, trying to understand is this is really the, the, the moment in which uh, the companies will really need to uh, to look at um, uh, investing. I mean, putting their money <laughs> where the where the talk is, and uh, if also let's say the political and the, the governmental uh, uh, system is going to be uh, you know up uh, 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 for the for uh, to continue and and to keep driving these um, uh, these changes uh, at the at the macroeconomic level, no. So, well, changes bring new opportunities. Uh, we believe that um, uh, the industry and technology and the, and the customers and the market itself is much more uh, uh, developed in terms of perceptions around uh, decarbonization or the need uh, to, to decarbonize our economic system. And um, uh, we, we feel like we're seeing now the, the, the correct conditions for this market to, uh, around the low carbon hydrogen to, to start taking off. Right. So, um, those would be my my short comments on the market. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Carlos. Um, uh, fantastic uh, remarks. Uh, I think has yield some really, really good insight into um, the lay of the land that with you, sort of the path we've trodden, so to speak, right? And uh, um, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear you actually reference uh, uncertainty um, because uh, I think oftentimes we can forget that things are are far from certain, um, particularly when we talk about development of new technologies, how market forces can actually render those technologies to be, um, you know, real in the marketplace, uh, and then what overlay policy can present. So, um, all very, very, very good points. Um, already got a few questions coming in. We're definitely going to get to those. Uh, I promise you later. Um, I saw one person actually ask about slides. Uh, we will actually start seeing slides now. So um, Carlos was just going to um, you know, talk as he did. Um, the slides will actually begin to move now as we go to Dolph, uh, who will actually present some of the work uh, and discuss some of the things that they see going on in the hydrogen space. So Dolph, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, Ken. Um, indeed, I have a few slides. And I can build nicely on what uh, what Carlos just uh, explained. So, uh, if you look at today's uh, uh, hydrogen use, um, about 120 million tons per year, and about a third of that is going to ammonia, and about a third of that is going to refining. These are two key areas of application. And so, today's hydrogen is is uh, mainly produced from natural gas, but there is also some production uh, from from coal, notably in China. And uh, it, it is so. It, it is grey hydrogen, with significant CO two emissions. And the interest in the, in the renewed interest in in hydrogen is to produce clean hydrogen, either the, what is called blue hydrogen, so fossil fuels with CCS, or green hydrogen, so that is uh, using renewable elec elec electricity, electrolysis uh, for, for hydrogen production. The, uh, the, there are significant uh, markets in the context of global decarbonization. And so an inc increasing number of countries are, uh, uh, are setting targets for net zero mid-century net zero CO2 emissions. And that means that you also need solutions for a lot of hard to, to decarbonize sectors where you could apply either hydrogen directly or you could uh, apply green commodities produced with hydrogen, such as ammonia or such as renewable methanol. And um, the hydrogen is a very so it, it's versatile on the supply side. It's also versatile on the application side. You, you can use it basically in all sectors. So in, in buildings, for heating, 
in industry for heating and, and as a feedstock uh, or in transport as, as an energy carrier. Uh, it is an energy carrier, it's not an energy source. That's uh, something uh, that, that makes a big difference because you always have to think about where will all that hydrogen come from. Um, at the International Renewable Energy Agency, of course, we're very much interested in hydrogen as a uh, vehicle to get more renewable electricity into the market. Also, uh, if you have electrolyzers, they can provide uh, interesting flexibility uh, to the power system. If you can vary the, the production of these electrolyzers, depending on the availability of, of, of solar and wind electricity, then that can help to, uh, in, to, to include higher shares of variable renewables into power systems. So today's market around 120 million tons per year in the 2050 uh, uh, time horizon, we see a market somewhere between 400 and 600, 700 uh, million tons of hydrogen, depending on whether you're aiming for a two degree scenario or a one and a half degree uh, climate change scenario. So some, uh, uh, let's say we're talking uh, total decarbonization. And, and here is an, 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 a list of major market opportunities. So there's a significant opportunity to to produce ammonia, both uh, for the existing fertilizer markets, but also ammonia as a fuel, for example, in, in shipping, ocean-going vessels that is discussed as an option now. Uh, you can use it to produce uh, iron and steel. I'll come to that point. Use uh, methanol, again, can be a chemical or a, a, a fuel. And uh, you can also use hydrogen in combination with CO2 to produce synfuels for example, for aviation safety. Uh, there's also uh, attention for hydrogen in existing gas systems. So today's gas systems uh, uh, can uh, have around 20, maybe 30% hydrogen on a volume basis, which is around 10% on an energy basis. But there is uh, quite a lot of studies now for European gas systems that suggest that they are able to take 100% renewables with very limited uh, uh, hydrogen with limited uh, changes in these gas systems. Generally, the pipelines are okay, uh, but the uh, compressors and the flanges, they, they need some, some attention. So uh, if you look at the hard to decarbonize sectors, so the energy intensive industries and uh, some of the transport applications, uh, here in, in green is, is indicated the role we see for uh, uh, hydrogen and, and hydrogen-based uh, synfuels in these sectors. So it's quite significant uh, in the transport sector, but it's also uh, significant for industry on the, on the left side. Now, this is a key graph. It's about the cost, the economics of uh, green and blue hydrogen. So as Carlos said, today, green hydrogen is considerably more expensive than gray hydrogen and even more expensive than blue hydrogen. Uh, it's somewhere between three and six, seven dollars per kilo of hydrogen today. But we see significant cost reductions in the two key cost components. So one is the cost of renewable electricity, and the other one is the cost of the electrolyzer. So we did a, a detailed electrolyzer study that was issued in December, and we see an opportunity to reduce the cost of these electrolyzers from uh, around $1,000 per, per kilowatt today to around $200 per kilowatt in the coming uh, 20 years or so. That comes through technology improvements, but very much also through upscaling, because it's today very early days. There's only 300 megawatts of electrolyzers in, in operation. If we talk about the volumes of hydrogen I, I just presented, we will need 2050, somewhere in the order of 2,000 to 4,000 gigawatts of electrolyzers. So massive, massive upscaling is needed. 
Um, especially in Europe at the moment, there is a strong interest in that, and, and there is an, an, a various numbers around. Uh, that there's a, a catapult initiative that uh, aims at 25 gigawatts by 2026. Uh, if you include all the, the numbers from the pipelines, there's somewhere between 60 and 80 gigawatts of projects that are in the country. So with that upscaling, the cost will come down, and we expect uh, 2040, 50, uh, the cost of hydro green, uh, green hydrogen to drop to below one and a half dollars per kilo. And at that cost level, it's, it's uh, cheaper in, in most circumstances than blue hydrogen. But it's still not a very cheap fuel. Huh? I mean, if you translate these costs into well, what it means per, per unit of energy, then uh, it's uh, somewhere between three and, and six times as expensive as natural gas is today. So that means that hydrogen will only be applied in specific circumstances, for example, where you cannot work with direct electrification. And uh, also, it means that that hydrogen will only come into play if there are indeed ambitious CO2 policies that are uh, operationalized. So to give you a few examples on ammonia, uh, so there you have the situation that today ammonia is produced from natural gas. CO2 is already separated from the hydrogen in that process. So therefore, blue does not add, to the, the additional uh, transportation and storage does usually not add that much cost. But still, there's a lot of attention right now also for green ammonia, for green hydrogen. So there's a 1.2 million ton uh, per year project in, in development in Saudi Arabia. Uh, Air Product is one of the partners in that. Uh, there are various plans also in, in for example, in Australia. So uh, it, it's, uh, there's a lot of attention for that now. And it's, it's various applications, of course, fertilizer, but also ammonia to be fueled in, in coal-fired power plant for CO2 reduction, for example, in Japan. And also, I mentioned already the uh, ammonia as, as uh, ocean-going shipping uh, uh, fuel. Uh, another example I wanted to mention is uh, direct reduced iron production uh, with hydrogen. So uh, if you take, for example, today, uh, say, say Europe, but also China, importing coking coal and iron ore from Australia, uh, there's a lot of, of shipping involved there. Um, and uh, there is an opportunity to produce already an, an intermediate product called direct reduced iron on site, on the mining site, and ship that instead of shipping these two commodities. So you would save on shipping costs, and you could tap into cheap renewable electricity in Australia. So uh, that, uh, uh, that type of relocation may happen in this specific case uh, for iron ore, but there may also be other products. I mean, I, I already mentioned ammonia as an, as an obvious example. Maybe the future energy intensive industries will not be anymore where they are today, but they will move to where there is cheap renewable electricity available. And hydrogen, it can be then the enabler for this type of, uh, of transition. So that concludes my introductory remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Dolph. A um, lot of really good uh, info there. I know there's a, the, we've already seen quite a few co uh, questions about costs come through, so uh, we'll definitely revisit that. And I know you, you guys have done a lot of work on that, so I'm sure you'll have some good feedback to to some of our viewers' questions on that front. So, um, but now we're gonna move o over to uh, Ricky. Uh, Ricky, the floor is yours. Great, can you hear me now? <clears throat> can you hear me now, Ken? Great. Hi everyone, I'm Ricky Sakai, uh, reading new business development around decarbonization at Mitsubishi Heavy Industries America here in Houston. Uh, thank you for having me today uh, I'm so excited to be on this fascinating panel. So Mitsubishi Heavy Industry, a MHI, 
as a technology focused company across industries, all the way from uh, energy, infrastructure, transportation, space, and defense for over 100 years. So throughout industrial revolution and growth of a society, internal combustion is our primary business for many decades. So we've been making a gas and steam turbines, boilers, uh, turbochargers, diesel engines, jet engines, rocket engines. So we're a jack of all trades of CO2 emitting equipment. So last year, uh, our CEO said, we are going to pivot and we are going to be an enabler of making society a better place in terms of carbon footprint. So energy transition is now our major focus. So we are in the middle of committing ourselves. So uh, with our focus on energy transition as a core strategy, MHI is combining a wide range of products and technologies uh, to make a carbon neutral, uh, carbon neutrality real. Uh, we are practically working to decarbonize uh, our energy supply to include increasing uh, the efficiency and the performance of thermal power, expanding renewables, using uh, nuclear to lower CO2 emissions, and stabilizing the supply through storage. But uh, reducing CO2 emission itself uh, is not enough to achieve carbon neutrality. So we are also expanding into new areas uh, where CO2 emissions are uh, unavoidable. Uh, the imp importance of technologies for uh, recovering and using CO2 will increase. As we already have a track record in CO2 recovery here in Texas and all over the world, and we'll uh, continue to promote uh, carbon recycling. That's a third step we see as an energy transition. As a fourth step, uh, we will work to build a hydrogen value chain, which is today's topic and the, it is very essential. But again, even though uh, we still have a lot of challenges like economic efficiency, but I believe that uh, achievement of net zero carbon by 2050 will be realistic uh, by making efforts for uh, technological innovation and business development uh, based on a, a long-term vision. So let me go to next. So now, uh, hydrogen uh, is essential uh, to achieving the energy transition, uh, but a wide range of solutions in the space uh, must be pursued and considered. Uh, MHI is committed to uh, uh, forwarding a variety of hydrogen solutions, as you can see on this slide. So as uh, demonstrated by our partnership and investment, so we have been conducting research and development on the use of hydrogen as a fuel, like a gas turbine. Uh, we do have hydrogen and combustion gas turbine all the way from 40 megawatt to 400 megawatts. And fuel cell battery engines for our power. We also have still making machinery business uh, who develop a uh, new way to utilize uh, hydrogen for direct reduction, as Dolph mentioned. Uh, and the process yeah, and the, the, the steel industry itself is emitting uh, like 88% of global carbon footprint. That's another important, you know, uh, the market we need to decarbonize. So in addition to that, uh, we do have a rocket business, uh, launching rockets, which is consuming a lot of our uh, rigid hydrogen as a fuel. And the, the, we look at the transportation, uh, we have compressor pumps and the ship's carrier for the ammonia and even CO2, uh, we are engaging uh, to design CO2 carrier. So those are available product in our portfolio, but it is difficult to create the value chain in a single phase, such as reducing just pro uh, the, the product cost. And the, we believe it is necessary to address uh, these issues uh, throughout the entire value chain, including production phase, storage phase, and the use of primary energy like a renewable and natural gas. So hydrogen in includes an expanding color palette, ranging from uh, gray, blue, and green, pink to turquoise, uh, with each color denoting uh, different convergent technologies utilizing different feedstock. The ultimate goal uh, should be to achieve uh, green hydrogen, which is created using renewable energy However, we need traditional colors 
such as blue and turquoise. So in order, in order to achieve green hydrogen, uh, that is why MHI is pursuing many colors of hydrogen. So now a new initiative uh, we have is a strategic partnership or with investment in water electrolysis, um, equipment supplier named Hydrogen Pro in Norway. So we announced a partnership. Uh, together with this company, uh, we aim to increase the scale and the efficiency of green hydrogen production. And also for turquoise hydrogen in particular is another solution, promising solution for the industry in accelerating energy transition. Uh, MHI is pursuing an investment strategy targeted at advancing breakthroughs in this space. So turquoise hydrogen is another CO2-free hydrogen, but also making solid carbon as byproduct, like a carbon black, uh, which has values in the market. And the, we recently started a strategic partnership uh, with two innovative startups named Monolith and C0, who develop uh, innovative methanpyrolysis technologies uh, that could set the blueprint for emerging technologies that deliver results quickly to the market. So uh, to make the most of our in-house technologies, we need to expand collaborations uh, with these partners and build a new value chain of carbon-free hydrogen. So that's our strategy around uh, hydrogen. And the, yeah, this is a, a last and third slide. So uh, this shows our hydrogen project development all over the world. So as you can see, uh, there are so many and multiple colors already uh, in the map. Actually, uh, many projects are coming up in Europe and the Asian Pacific, and even in the United States. So uh, it is essential that uh, stakeholders work together to achieve a sustainable and the resilient long-term future for the energy sector. MHI Group uh, has a number of innovative partnerships and projects that are helping to advance hydrogen solutions. And yeah, I, I wanted to introduce all projects, but it should take another two, three hours. So uh, let me introduce a couple of projects in the United States. So uh, in, instead of UTER, uh, we are collaborating with Magnum, who is developing the gas storage, uh, aim to produce a and the store hydrogen for use as fuel in the hydrogen gas turbines. Uh, that is supplied by our group company, Mitsubishi Power. So using our uh, gas turbine technology above ground and the Magnum has a uh, capability to store uh, the hydrogen in certain dome in underground. So this project uh, will develop up to 70 cabin, 70 cabin uh, that are each capable storing uh, 100 gigawatt hour uh, for long-term renewable energy. So this is a, a very innovative tech, uh, project. And second, uh, we recently announced our participation uh, in the U.S. Department of Energy's H2 upscale project in Texas. The project intend to show uh, the renewable hydrogen can be a cost-effective fuel for multiple end-use applications, including fuel cell or uh, electric vehicle, when coupled with our large base road customers that use hydrogen for clean and reliable of stationary power. So it aims to enable affordable hydrogen production, distribution, and utilization across multiple sectors uh, in the economy of Texas. So uh, this project includes a, a number of partners and stakeholders, including Frontier Energy, GTI, uh, University of Texas, Austin, and Toyota, and other industrial partners. So uh, MHI owns and operates 80 megawatt wind farm in West Texas. Uh, we will uh, contribute to the project by providing operational data from wind farm, which will be used to control the hydrogen production by electrolysis. So uh, as a conclusion, uh, we, now, we know that uh, Pass to the carbon neutral world or won't come easily for many industry sectors. And the, we are prepared to harness our manufacturing and technological expertise uh, to continue to deliver hydrogen solution to our customers and partners. That's my remarks. Thank you, Ken. 
Thank you, Ricky. Um, so you touched on something, and there's been a couple of questions come up. Um, you know, uh, that came up actually as you were presenting, but also just sort of sprinkled throughout. Um, related to the palette, the color palette, right? The growing rainbow, if you will, of hydrogen. Um, most people are aware of what, you know, gray, blue, and green hydrogen are. Um, and we'll definitely come back to uh, uh, questions regarding the cost, uh, Dolph. So, um, you know, get ready for that uh, on the green front. But you mentioned some of the other colors. So, you know, we have obviously pink, we have turquoise, um, you know, there's yellow, there's, you know, everything that, that, you know, every color, as you mentioned, corresponds to a different conversion technology. But uh, one in particular that, and I mentioned this one simply because there's there's activity going on here at Rice that, that relates to turquoise hydrogen production. Um, and you mentioned mm -hmm. it uh, in relation to the work that MHI is doing with, um, uh, monolith and C0. Uh, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit for the benefit of our audience exactly what turquoise hydrogen is and, um, you know, maybe talk a little bit about uh, the prospect of carbon to value, which um, can help propel the commercial viability of those kinds of projects, because that, that solid carbon byproduct is ultimately a marketable product. Um, you know, given, you know, some breakthroughs perhaps in material science, but but because the carbon black market is not really big enough to absorb all everything that would be forthcoming, but uh, certainly there is a prospect. So I wonder if you could elaborate on that just a little bit. Sure. Yeah, you already elaborated, but the, yeah, turquoise hydrogen, yeah, is another CO2 free hydrogen, uh, which is coming from uh, methane pyrolysis technologies. There are many types of methane pyrolysis technologies, but for instance, monoliths uh, has a plasma uh, generator technology, uh, which can you know uh, generate hydrogen by using a plasma reactor, and the, the, which can you know uh, produce both uh, carbon-free hydrogen and the carbon black, and the carbon black uh, has a big market uh, in the world uh, for the tire uh, material. And the, as you know, our population in the world is growing. The the market of the carbon black is also growing. So as we you know all produce and monolith produce the hydrogen and carbon black, we can sell both as a you know very valuable product. So that will enable to lower the cost of the hydrogen as we you know all sell carbon black as a, another product. So, so that's a kind of beauty of this technology and the e color of hydrogen. Great, thanks. Um, so Dolph, real quick, uh, because a few questions have come in uh, on the front of you know, cost reductions. Um, and you made a comment in your presentation as you talked about the cost reductions and where things might go, that it's still an expensive fuel um, when we talk about hydrogen in, in relation to you know, natural gas that, that's priced in the 2 to $4 range, as, as we typically have been seeing over the last several years here in, in, in Texas and the U.S. more broadly. But um, uh, I wonder if you could maybe expand on, on this in, in two ways. Um, I guess the first one is, uh, as hydrogen technology, particularly green hydrogen technology, is scaled, um, you know, how rapidly... Um, do you think, A, that can happen with or without policy support? So, you know, that's, that's, there's, there's sort of embedded in there the role that policy will ultimately play in helping to propel um, the pace of change with regard to costs uh, for green hydrogen production. But also, um, you know, as you sort of look out and you see more green hydrogen production maybe uh, uh, penetrating the market, um, you know, how do you see that impacting development um, more broadly across the energy value chain? And this value chain question, I'm going to come back to both, uh, both, both to you, Ricky, and uh, Carlos on, but um, because it is actually, you know, instrumental when you think about any energy source and its its integration into um, uh, energy ecosystems. But how how do you see things developing in Europe? Uh, in the U.S., potentially longer term in Asia, in, in Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, et cetera, on value chain development in terms of how we actually move hydrogen. Um, is it going to be, you know, um, 
and this kind of gets into the power to X space, but uh, generally when we just think about green hydrogen generation capacity, um, you know, how rapidly you think those cost reductions will occur and how do you think that will propel um, value chain generation? So Dolph, uh, I'm gonna leave that to you first. Yeah, thank you very much, Ken. Um, on the on the cost uh, uh, reductions for green hydrogen, um, it, there were interesting comments from two of the major electrolyzer uh, producers this week. So there was uh, IPM Power and there was uh, NEL. And uh, for example, NEL said uh, uh, they expect a, a 75 percent cost reduction in the 2025 time frame and two dollars per kilo by then. So they're even more optimistic than, than we are. Uh, but of course, the, the key uh, question there is uh, uh, that is true if you have cheap electricity. In the end, it, it's, it's all about how much will renewable electricity cost. You. So there may be certain locations where there is good wind, good PV, where you can get to these price levels, but it's not a general price level. It, it's, it's unlikely you reach these price levels for production in Northwestern Europe or in Japan, for example. So, so uh, that is a, a key variable. And because there are these price differences for renewable electricity, it, it's likely that, uh, that you will see in the future trade. And the question is, will that be trade of hydrogen or will that be trade of commodities produced with hydrogen? Uh, because hydrogen trade is currently being uh, developed. So J Japan is, is, is a leading country uh, in, in that, and, and really refer to that. Uh, so so they, they're looking at different uh, trade trade options, but no matter what, the, 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 the shipping of hydrogen will add significant additional cost to the production cost. And so if you can ship uh, uh, ammonia, or some other commodity that's a lot cheaper. So uh, if we talk about an international and a global trade system, then uh, uh, my expectation would be that we don't start with trade of, of hydrogen purely for, for a, as hydrogen energy carrier, but that we start with green commodities. Um, and uh, pipeline transportation, uh, where possible, is cheaper than uh, shipping hydrogen. So, uh, and, and there are interesting opportunities also to uh, redeploy existing natural gas pipelines and, and transport uh, hydrogen through these uh, pipelines. Um, Regarding the application, indeed, uh, hydrogen will remain an, 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 a relatively expensive fuel. So, for example, the ideas of uh, uh, using hydrogen and, and replacing natural gas in existing uh, uh, building heating systems, that can technically be done, but uh, uh, with today's efficiency standards in all buildings, you will end up with a high heating bill. So that only makes sense if you have a building which has been retrofitted uh, energy efficiency, which is highly energy efficient. And then you get into the question, well, should you then deploy hydrogen or is that building so efficient that, that heat pumps are perhaps the better solution? So in general, that's why I said, in general, we see direct electrification as the preferred option and hydrogen as the, 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 the second best option. Okay, that's no, that's interesting. Thank you. Um, uh, the the value chain question is is actually related to another question that's that's come up in the um, uh, from our from our listeners, um, and and I'll sort of try to weave this together so that all of you can comment. Um, and I'll start with you first, Carlos. But um, you know, some questions have come through about what do you see as the biggest impediments to um, you know, broader use of hydrogen. Um, uh, and I think, Dolph, you just you know, mentioned the, the commercial drivers, right? Sort of hydrogen, is it competitive with other 
technology options or other energy source options, which is obviously one. But um, aside from those, um, you know, what other impediments um, or challenges or obstacles, hurdles, however you want to frame it, uh, exist? Um, what role do you think policy might play in helping to overcome those in addition to technological change? Um, and, and then the reason that's a relevant question for the value chain uh, uh, discussion is, you know, when you talk about any energy source and its ability to scale, um, you really do have to have all the supporting infrastructure in place as well. So this is, you know, the supply chain to develop the energy source as well as uh, the value chain to monetize the energy or the energy service that it provides. So um, all of the infrastructure that is required to make it go, right? Um, and in some of the newer energy technology applications, a lot of that is very greenfield. Um, in some other energy technology applications, you can leverage existing infrastructure or legacy assets. And so I wonder if, uh, uh, and I'll start with you, Carlos, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about, you know, where you see uh, the biggest hurdles for scaling uh, hydrogen uh, existing and, you know, how you think that translates into full value chain development. So in other words, you know, how can legacy infrastructure be, 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 be leveraged uh, as we sort of migrate to a broader sort of hydrogen or set of hydrogen applications. So, Carlos? Okay, thanks, Ken. Well, um, the, the, the major, let's say, roadblock is, of course, a uh, cost uh, of production of hydrogen. No, we have, um, there's, there are significant uh, differences between the cost of green hydrogen and, let's say, gray or uh, blue hydrogen uh, from natural gas right now. But that's in the U.S., and that's particularly uh, driven because of the very low cost of natural gas in the U.S. since the, uh, the shale gas revolution. So, but when you look at other geographies, uh, you're having a very different picture. So, in some in some places where the cost of natural gas is higher, let's say close to uh, I don't know eight, nine, ten dollars per million BTU and the cost of electricity is, let's say, uh, lower or is more, let's say, similar to the average uh, uh, or to levels that you're seeing in the U.S., uh, then the, 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 cost, the, product, the cost of production factor uh, plays out in a completely different way. So when you look at these um, impediments, you will, of course, have to, ha have to think about the, the particular conditions of, uh, of the areas in which you are trying to, to, develop, um, uh, to develop your project. Uh, no? uh, in terms of um, um, how to use or, or, or what role can play the existing infrastructure, um, we think that uh, is is key uh, to be uh, uh, to be uh, possible to use existing infrastructure uh, to the to the to, uh, a, 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 as possible to be able to uh, facilitate the development of some projects. I'm gonna talk with uh, a specific case and say uh, the, the carbon uh, capture and storage projects. So one of the uh, key hurdles there is uh, the cost uh, associated with the pipeline uh, transportation infrastructure that is required to take the hydrogen from the capture facility onto, uh, uh, until, uh, uh, to, the, to the geological site. So if you factor in the cost of developing those, uh, those pipelines in any project, you're, you're out of business. That is, uh, that is not going to happen. But that's when uh, the use of existing infrastructure became, becomes so relevant and so important to be able to facilitate these projects. So there is a number of um, uh, CO2 uh, pipelines, for example, in the Texas region uh, that are being used mostly for, uh, for enhanced oil recovery. And uh, you, know, you can easily use that infrastructure to transport uh, 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 the CO2 until the geological sites. So I, I just wanted to highlight this, uh, uh, this because it's a very clear, uh, it's a very clear uh, uh, example. No? Uh, in terms of, so of the value chain, uh, um, uh, when we look at, um, let's say, the, the end users of hydrogen, uh, if we think at hydrogen for mobility, um, one of the barriers that uh, we have seen is, of course, the, the level of uh, development and penetration of, let's say, hydrogen-based uh, vehicles, so let's say uh, fuel cell vehicles. So there is a whole um, uh, uh, coordination and a whole ramp up that has to happen between the industry, the industry that is producing the fuel and the type of fuel 
and the and, and the manufacturers of the vehicles or applications in which you know this hydrogen uh, is going to be to be used. So uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, those two things are not going uh, hand in hand. Let's say uh, uh, on the hydrogen for mobility side, the ramp up on uh, let's say availability of fuel cells and, uh, and, and, and that the customers adopt that system is 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 is, is very is, is very low and there is a big disconnect. Uh, with, with the big plans that are for using hydrogen uh, 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 for mobility. No? So in terms of when you see that policy can play really a role in terms of trying to, you know, uh, uh, let's say, be the driver or be the, uh, uh, the, the, the link in between uh, this to create the, the, the conditions that, that, that are required. For example, uh, things like um, uh, injecting uh, hydrogen in natural gas uh, a broader policy, uh, uh, a good policy uh, uh, development on that will not also uh, will not only allow that there are new players into the market, electricity companies using producing hydrogen to sell a, a, a lower carbon and uh, let's say electricity into the grid, but it will also help lower the overall uh, uh, carbon intensity of the natural gas grid, and it will allow that we use the natural gas grid to transport hydrogen, similarly as uh, what is being done with uh, renewable natural gas, let's say under a book and claim uh, uh, approach. No? So that the, the role that uh, a policy can play is really how to bring together, let's say, all these, uh, all these pieces and try to align, let's say, uh, try to help uh, align in this, uh, 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 this uh, let's say, expectations and requirements. Great, thanks. So, um, real quick, well, real, uh, real quickly, uh, Ricky, um, you showed a map at the end of your presentation that that sort of touches on something that that Carlos just said, specifically with regard to how you know the economics might play out on a regional basis differently. Um, and I wonder if you could just real briefly speak to that point, um, and also layer in where you're seeing. Um, not only the commercial drivers, but p potentially even policy-related drivers helping to facilitate growth in different options for hydrogen that MHI is investing in around the world. Sure. Yeah, as, as Ken described, each region have, you know, all different perspective and challenges and also opportunities. So as I as I showed on this map, uh, the, if for instance, in Japan, uh, electricity for renewable is not competitive yet, it's still high. And also uh, we are importing all you know natural resources outside of Japan. So it is not easy and competitive to produce hydrogen in Japan. So in case of the e, e, Japan, other, you know, Countries uh, where have similar issues need to, you know, import hydrogen or ammonia. So one example in Japan is that as a tra transitional fuel, uh, ammonia uh, is one solution to, you know, mix for the coal-fired power plant. So to, you know, uh, continue the operation of coal fire by mixing ammonia as a fuel. So by importing, you know, a fuel as ammonia, ammonia could be, a, you know, a carrier for hydrogen for long term. So uh, once the hydrogen infra infrastructures and the, the you know, uh, uh, demand in Japan are growing, uh, ammonia could be, you know, cracked uh, to hydrogen. So that's why MHI sees ammonia as a traditional fuel. Uh, to the country and regions uh, where has uh, you know where is hurt uh, to produce hydrogen in in the domestic countries. So in the, but in case of the United States, as you see, you know uh, a lot of green dots uh, across states. So our Mitsubishi Power, our group company Mitsubishi Power, announced uh, many you know uh, projects uh, with customers in northeast. And also uh, in in Texas region, uh, the Shipy Energy uh, decarbonization collaboration is the one to you know uh, deploy green green hydrogen in the future for the existing asset where we you know delivered our gas turbine, which is currently you know piling uh, based on the natural gas. 
but the as you know our hydrogen network is growing so uh, it hydrogen will be you know uh, mixed in the pipeline and also stored in the existing infrastructures uh, across the Gulf Coast. So uh, hydrogen could be also transitional fuel or with natural gas. So especially such countries in the United States. So that's a kind of uh, the approach we are doing. Thanks. Uh, then actually, just staying on this map real briefly um, <clears throat> before I move on from this topic. Um, there's a couple of questions that have come across with regard to, you know, blending and and, and Dolph, uh, Carlos, feel free to jump in here too if if you'd like. Um, uh, with with regard to blending hydrogen with natural gas and moving it on natural gas infrastructure, um, a couple of questions come across about what that does to the product integrity of the natural gas stream on the pipeline. Um, for example, how that might affect heating values of the product and, and what that means for LNG exports, ultimately, you know, where, where natural gas is, is, is being fed into those facilities. So um, I wonder if, 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 you know, any of you can, can maybe comment on that and uh, um, discuss whether or not you see that as an impediment to, to large scale use of, of natural gas infrastructure to move hydrogen. Yeah. Can, yes, we see that as an uh, as an impediment. There are a number of you know uh, many other te uh, technical aspects that you will have to look at it. Uh, starting from the actual pipelines themselves are not built to transport hydrogen, so you will need some sort of coating or some. Uh, uh, I mean, changing the whole pipeline is probably not an option, but to develop, let's say, coatings that can be you know uh, applied uh, to existing infrastructure to 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 deal with uh, with that. There are, let's say, other problems also on the power generation side. So let's say the hydrogen molecule doesn't have enough mass to move the turbine. <laughs> you will need a little bit uh, more mass there. And you could do that with CO2 or some other uh, molecules uh, into that mix, but that's a big if that still has to be sorted out. And uh, in particular, it would require a lot of uh, technical development between the, 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 the grid operators and the, uh, and, and, the, and the turbine manufacturers. No, so uh, in terms of LNG, that is a really key question. So that you know, it will have a big impact to have a, a, a content of nitrogen uh, uh, for LNG production. But then you have to think that you know, not all of the grid will probably be interconnected. No, uh, so there might be, uh, let's say, some sort of intermediate of solution in which, let's say, uh, uh, you know, the, the LNG production is fairly, you know, localized in a in a in a in an area, no, uh, so, so that could potentially be handled. But that, that is all part of what, let's say, uh, the, the, the government or let's say the, the policy developers will have to uh, to consider when they are uh, uh, um, uh, improving or uh, facilitating uh, the, from the regulatory point of view that hydrogen is used uh, uh, in a pipeline. So agree, yes, uh, there are many, still many, uh, many, uh, many technical hurdles to be overcome uh, without still getting even into the commercial side. So, Great. Um, thanks, Carlos. Dolph, um, this kind of steps into another question that has been raised by several of the of the viewers today, um, specifically related to um, scalability, uh, sort of how much scale is required to deliver the amount of you know, energy service uh, that we you know, currently see being satisfied by other fuels if we were to Sort of go to a you know an all hydrogen kind of future, and and I think you you even mentioned it's not going to be an all hydrogen future, but just sort of uh, play this out with me uh, briefly because there are some questions related to you know things for example is how much water is required and you know what is the uh, qual water quality have to be in order to you know use you know electrolyzers given current state of technology um, to generate hydrogen um, and then. Uh, in addition to that, how much, if it's all green hydrogen that we talk about, uh, how much additional renewable energy capacity would have to be added in order to facilitate, um, you know, a significant amount of green hydrogen production to do things like DRI or other, you know, industrial applications uh, at scale? So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Sure. Um... 
The first observation is that today hydrogen is, is already quite significant in, in energy terms. It's, it's about 2% of global uh, uh, final energy. So uh, that's not trivial. In a decarbonized world, we can see that increase to 10 to 25 percent, perhaps at the very high end of 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 uh, final energy use. And and that would require, if all of that were green, you would require uh, thousands of gigawatts of additional renewable capacity. So the, the, the lower end is somewhere like 2,000, the higher end is perhaps 5,000 gigawatt. Uh, and, and that compares with today's installed global solar and wind capacity of around 1,500 gigawatt. So hydrogen production alone would be a multiple of today's total installed solar and wind capacity. Uh, but it, it would still be only a fraction of, of the total amount of renewable uh, energy we would need. So it, it, it's part of an, uh, of an energy system then that is basically electrified, either directly electrified or electrified through uh, hydrogen. And um, I, I didn't completely answer this, this first question about the value chains. I mean, if you if you look at the discussions in Europe to, today, for example, in Germany, Germany is talking about importing 80% of its hydrogen and, 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 and uh, is therefore in discussion with a lot of potential suppliers. So say Chile, Colombia, Morocco, South Africa, the whole of the Middle East, Australia, they're all looking at, at uh, the hydrogen export opportunity and there are projects uh, being developed in all these countries. Uh, we have uh, developed an, 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 a platform to discuss these developments, a collaborative framework on, on green hydrogen. There's now 45 countries, the, the, the World Hydrogen Council, International Partnership of Hydrogen Economy, and so they, they all participate in that discussion. And um, one of the issues that is on the agenda uh, and, and that is potentially an, 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 an issue to develop this sector is, how do you really guarantee what is being traded is green hydrogen? So we will need some system of guarantees of, of origin standards and certification to make sure that it's really uh, a green or clean hydrogen that is being traded. And that, that is one of the areas of policy development at this moment. Now that's interesting because that you know the, there are parallels in that space uh, in terms of um, certification of standard with regard to uh, you know how green a product is. You see that emerging in liquefied natural gas markets now, with uh, you know some some marketers and developers actually seeking to differentiate their product through the use of offsets. Um, so it's a different type of discussion, but it's similar in with regard to certification and the need for that to to sort of occur, right? Um, so interesting, uh, interesting, uh, interesting point. So um, real quick, I did also ask about water quality. So, you know, because this begs the question in terms of resource scarcity, right? When you think about um, how much water would be required to run electrolyzers, um, you know, questions are coming up um, uh, about what, what quality water do you need to actually successfully run these electrolyzers to, to generate hydrogen? Yeah, so, so uh, it needs to be quite pure water. If you cannot use seawater, that was one of the questions. Uh, and uh, the amount of water you need per kilo of hydrogen is, if, if I recall correctly, somewhere between 10 and 15 liters. Uh, so uh, you don't you don't need uh, lakes of water or rivers full of water to 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 for this electrolysis, but it, it's it's one of the components you have to think of. Great, thanks. Um, so we're we're getting close to being out of time. I just want to tell everybody that that the slides uh, are typically available online. Um, you know, at the same site where you registered, uh, so you should be able to access them. Um, uh, and uh, of course, the the 
the entire webinar is archived. So you'll be able to watch this at your leisure later if there's something you missed. Uh, and if there's a question that comes up, you know, I've, I've worked with, with everybody here uh, to varying extents over time, um, and I'm sure they'd be happy to answer questions if they come up. So you can forward those to me uh, and my team will be sure they get them if we didn't get to get to a specific question that you might have. So feel free to do that. But um, before we uh, sort of wrap up, I wanna sort of give uh, you know, some time to one specific question that comes up almost every time I'm involved in a conversation around hydrogen. Uh, and Carlos, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll lean in on you to answer this one since you're in the industrial gas space and you're very familiar with the protocols around this question that are in place. Um, they have to do with the safety of hydrogen as an energy source. I wonder if you could just briefly talk about that before we wrap. Mm -hmm. Yes, well, I, I... In general terms, I mean, um, um, safety of hydrogen is, I mean, there is not a real concern, uh, a real clear concern around that. We historically have not had, let's say, major incidents uh, around the production and uh, transportation or utilization of hydrogen. No, I, I, I cannot speak around, let's say, the use of hydrogen in applications, let's say, for, for vehicles or for, or, or for others. But in terms of uh, producing and distributing the hydrogen, uh, I think um, th there are, uh, of course, the, the, the normal safety concerns, but uh, it is not perceived uh, that that can be that safety risk uh, will play uh, a big role. Um, you know, the, the, the safety procedures on how to produce, distribute, and store hydrogen are, uh, let's say, old. I mean, this this this, this industry has been uh, we have been doing this for for, for many uh, decades, so it has, of course, uh, improved. And um, you know, in general, uh, let's say that's something that uh, can be handled, and um, that should not represent a, a, a major concern. Uh, now, in terms of the use of highly compressed hydrogen uh, in, in in applications, you no, know, like um, uh, like cars, uh, 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 trucks, etc., uh, there will have to be uh, uh, more considerations. But personally, I'm I'm not that familiar with those ones. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Uh, I appreciate that. And and I mean, for those of you who are interested, there is a lot of there are a lot of resources available that discuss you know the various dimensions of safety around, for example, fuel cell applications and storage of hydrogen in in transportation. Um, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of interest uh, in developing you know those those pathways, and so safety protocols and appropriate regulatory frameworks are, are conversations that are being had and, and, and thought through uh, very robustly. Um, uh, and perhaps on a, on a later, uh, at a later date, we'll be able to address some of those as we revisit this ever expanding and dynamic space. Um, uh, but we are actually up against it on time, unfortunately. Um, I wanna, uh, first of all, thank uh, Carlos Dolph and um, Ricky for joining us. Um, and uh, just real briefly, I want to give you both, and I, all three of you mean an opportunity to um, uh, just make a final comment with regard to uh, our discussion today. So I'll start with you, Ricky. Sure. Again, thank you very much for having me. Yeah, as I made the remarks at the beginning, uh, we are committed to, you know, materialize this car uh, carbon tran uh, the energy transition on the hydrogen is one of the key strategy for us. So oh, we are happy to you know, enable this by working with partners and collaborations. Thank you very much for having me today. Thank you, Ricky. Dolph? Yeah, so we, we uh, are continually expanding our work in this area, and, and that includes work around this issue of standards I mentioned, but also the, the, the uh, safety and, and transportation related aspects as well as the economics. So any questions, happy to answer. Thanks, Dolph. And Carlos? Yes, well, uh, thanks uh, for the opportunity to participate in, uh, in the webinar. Um, um, Hydro decarbonization of hydrogen is one of our company's um, main targets, and uh, it's, a, it's our expectation that uh, this is going to grow into um, uh, into a uh, into a bigger business. Uh, so we remain committed um, uh, from uh, let's say from from both our uh, corporate social responsibility also, but uh, let's say in terms of uh, perceiving hydrogen as a as a good way to uh, generate value uh, or low carbon hydrogen as a good way to generate value for our shareholders. Um, 
we remain open for any questions, uh, any follow-up uh, uh, questions that um, you know uh, anybody might have. Uh, we'll be happy to uh, to help with uh, any information or uh, look at uh, potential leads. Thank you, uh, and, and thanks again to all three of you for, for participating today. It's a fantastic uh, stream of information. We could continue the conversation for at least another hour, um, but that just gives us a reason to get back together again in the future to discuss um, this, this really interesting uh, topic um, as it relates to energy transitions and decarbonization. You know, hydrogen is, uh, in many ways, a unique opportunity in that entire space because it can be produced in so many different ways. Uh, it can be moved in so many different ways and it has so many different applications that it really just sort of uh, opens the mind to um, uh, all the different possibilities. Of course, there are barriers just as there is with anything else uh, to value chain development um, to uh, that it range from, you know, uh, regulatory and legal issues to commercial issues. So. Uh, it's a space to definitely continue to watch, uh, and I definitely look forward to continuing engaging in this stuff. And for all of you who are interested um, in the topic, uh, just stay tuned because um, here at the Baker Institute, we, like a lot of other groups, are um, really looking at all aspects of hydrogen from um, the minerals and metals that are required for uh, development of the resource, um, you know, to the different technologies that can be applied and how those mineral, minerals and metals might actually uh, impact um, uh, uh, the development of those technologies. And then effectively how what we like to call the principle of comparative advantage will affect regional deployment of different options. So um, it's a really dynamic space, uh, really look forward to continue to engage. Um, and in the meantime, everybody uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and uh, we'll see you next time.